Price gouging isn't specifically defined in our Act. Um, it's not specifically defined in any particular reg uh, regulation. Um, it's, it's not defined um, or indicated as some conduct that is specifically prohibited. So we deal with this in terms of our excessive pricing provisions, and those are found in Section 8. Uh, and Section 8.1a in particular deals with excessive pricing. Um, this is part of the abuse of dominance proceedings. So what this requires is that uh, in order for this to apply to you, you need to be a dominant firm. So you need to be a firm that has market power. And uh, we have provisions in our Act in Section 7, uh, which creates a presumption that you have uh, that you are dominant. Uh, but as we saw, even in the Babalehi case, where they indicated that they have less than 5% market share, uh, that in itself was still found um, not to impact its ability to have market power. So it had market power, even though it had very small market shares. The other thing that is required in order for these excessive pricing provisions to apply um, is you must meet the threshold that is set by the minister. Uh, and that means that you must have an annual turnover or assets in the Republic either at or exceeding 5 million rand. So if you're smaller than that, then these provisions don't apply to you. Um, but this does mean that even if you are a small or medium business, uh, even a family-owned business, we've seen you can still fall foul of these provisions. So market power um, is essentially your ability to control your prices, to exclude competition, um, and to act independently of what your other competitors are doing and what your customers are doing. So in practical terms, it means you're able to increase your price um, and, and not have a fear that you're going to be impacted by competition from a competitor or that your customers are going to complain um, and be able to, to resist buying from you. So what COVID-19 has taught us is that um, in terms of this crisis, there are a lot of, of companies that actually, um, because of the pandemic, have, have got market power where they normally wouldn't have had market power. Um, and, and we looked at determining market power um, through the behavior. Normally in excessive pricing cases, what we used to look at, um, and what we'll continue to look at, uh, is, is what happens in terms of the market, how do you determine your market share. Um, and, and what we did here is that we actually looked at um, can you determine from the behavior of the person or the firm that they have market power? And we found that, yes, you could, and, and that's been confirmed by the courts. So in addition to the Act, we also had the price gouging regulations, which are the consumer protection regulations, as they generally refer to. And these regulations were implemented specifically to address COVID-19 excessive pricing cases. They only apply from the 19th of March 2020, um, and they only apply to an increase uh, of price during the uh, period of the national disaster. So come the end of the national disaster period, they won't be of application before. And, and I'll address, Nana, what happened to cases that occurred prior to uh, the implementation of these regulations. The other thing that these regulations do is that they specifically identify um, the products to which they relate. And these products uh, include basic food and consumer items, uh, emergency products and services, medical and hygiene supplies, emergency cleanup uh, products and services. So um, those are reflected in Annex A and B to the regulations, but I think it's very important to indicate as well, as I'll also touch on later, that um, even if there's a product that's not dealt with in terms of the regulations, not specifically identified, or if the conduct falls outside of this period, it is still possible to prosecute for excessive pricing without reference to the regulations because our excessive pricing provisions in the Act have been found to be sufficient to do that. So what, what is the purpose of these regulations? Essentially, it, it creates a, a presumption 
that where prices have increased materially and costs haven't increased, that could justify that, um, or where the net margin or markup on the price increases above the average margin or markup in the three months prior to the 1st of March 2020, um, it can then be assumed that there is a prima facie case, uh, that's a case at face value that has been proved by the Commission, uh, that there is excessive and uh, unfair pricing. So um, these are very useful in, in practical terms. Um, we have litigated in terms of the regulations and without the regulations. Um, and and the regulations make provisions specifically for, for a fine um, of, of a million rand, of up to 10% of turnover, which is also provided for in our Act, and for imprisonment of up to 12 months. So the consequences are serious. There were further regulations that were also published, and, and these are um, dealing with the processes uh, of the competition tribunal. Also directed specifically at the COVID-19 pricing complaints, um, and these were, were published on the 3rd of April 2020. Um, and there were some debates in some of the cases that we had uh, about whether these uh, truncated periods that are provided for in these rules could be applied to conduct which is not dealt with in terms of the regulations because um, the tribunal rules specifically refer to the regulations and the Act. Um, and and the courts have found, and the, the tribunal in particular in the DISCIM matter indicated that in terms of its normal uh, rules uh, and, and powers, it is able to hear uh, matters on an urgent basis and to arrange time pay periods in, in a truncated fashion. So these uh, tribunal rules uh, are also applicable only during the national state of disaster, but as I've indicated, uh, that doesn't limit the tribunal from making such orders. It allows for the urgent hearing of uh, of proceedings, and, and as Kanye indicated earlier on, um, we, we dealt with a lot of matters within a very short space of time. Um, these rules provide for 72 hours in response to filing an answering affidavit and then 24 hours to file a replying affidavit. So um, the Babalehi matter, which was our first matter, was dealt with over the Easter weekend um, uh, and uh, it required a lot of, of late nights and, um, and hard work. But um, it, it was very important for us to address uh, the increase in, in prices, um, particularly as, as they're related to essential products. Uh, what, what these rules also provide for, and what we've really made a lot of use of during this period, is the filing of documents e electronically, these shortened timeframes for the hearing of matters, and then also the hearing of matters via um, Microsoft Teams primarily. Uh, and, and what these rules provide for is an expedited procedure um, for resolving a, a substantial dispute of, of fact. So even if there's a, a dispute of fact on, on the papers, because these are referred by way of notice of motion and affidavit, um, then still there are truncated time periods and the tribunal can make specific arrangements to, to hear proceedings um, within a short time frame um, and direct particularly which pieces of evidence it wants to hear testimony on. Uh, and, and this is something that, that was used uh, successfully in the uh, blue collar and Alta Tico matter, uh, which we were still waiting for, for judgment on. The other thing that the rules provide for is that consent agreements can be confirmed without hearing evidence. Um, and and one of the things that we have found, and, and certainly in the matters that I've dealt with, is that um, following the judgments that we were able to achieve in these matters, uh, there was a, a, a significant willingness of parties to enter into settlement agreements. And then these were processed quite quickly with the tribunal without the need to hear evidence. Um, initially, while we were waiting for final determination of the Babalehi and Diskem matters, um, because those were the first ones of their kind. Uh, some parties were indicating that they first wanted to see uh, what was going to happen in those matters before they entered into settlement agreements. But as I've indicated, the settlement agreements then, then flowed. 